Hey y'all, here at OS Reviews. Today we're taking a revisited look back at the Huawei Mate Book. This is the original first gen model that debuted in 2016, and it was actually Huawei's first foray into making laptops. And in subsequent years, they came out with more models, including the Mate Book X, which became more popular as a conventional form factor. But it was interesting that their first attempt was actually a two in one convertible. It can be detached from the dock here and be used like a tablet, similar to a Microsoft Surface, and then of course popped into this pretty classy looking folio case even all these years later to transform it into more of a regular laptop with a glass trackpad and a backlit keyboard. Now in terms of power, this thing actually has very similar hardware as the 2015 and 2016 12-inch MacBooks from Apple, but its claim to fame is having a super slim form factor, being one of the first devices to use USB Type-C for charging, and just being an easy computer to carry with you when you're on the go, which from a design perspective has held up still quite well, even if the performance, especially in terms of GPU, is not very powerful for anything that is heavier than just casual computing needs. But this was essentially a Windows equivalent of the 12-inch MacBook, with a similar emphasis on style and portability. It has a similar 12-inch super high-res 2K resolution IPS LCD screen, which is touch sensitive and also supports Wacom styluses that you can use to add pressure sensitivity for drawing and doodling or signing documents. It can be configured up to 8 gigabytes of RAM like the 12-inch MacBook and also comes equipped with a Core M3 or a Core M5 processor. These are fanless, completely silent machines and also has a fingerprint scanner built onto the side that we'll see in a moment, making it easier to authenticate and log into the system which was pretty advanced for its time. And by the way, Huawei still continues to make two-in-one convertible tablet slash laptop devices. They're now called the MateBook E series. It retains a pretty similar design overall, but the newest MateBook E actually now has an OLED screen instead of being IPS LCD, so a little bit more contrast rich, and it actually is using an ARM-based processor now, which is even more power efficient compared to Intel x86 chips, although the downside is app compatibility may not be quite as exhaustive as on legacy x86 Intel processors. You can now find these things when shopping around for around 100 to 150 bucks. Again, quite similar to the 12 inch MacBook. These are more common though if you are in market regions in Asia. Closer look at the design, I'm definitely a fan of the way it looks. Quite sleek, even by 2023 24 standards. There's just the optional magnetic slot on the back of the folio where you can snap on the stylus. The magnets here are quite strong, and when opening it up, you'll find Huawei's slogan imprinted on the top here, which says, Make it possible followed by the keyboard as well as the display. And I have to say for a 2016 device, the bezel size on this original MateBook from Huawei was actually pretty ahead of its time. It still seems quite slim, even by today's standard, making the screen to body ratio still look quite good as you're consuming media. And it has a rather boxy aspect ratio, a little closer to something like an iPad, making it a little easier for things like reading back articles and PDFs, as opposed to being super widescreen. There's just a webcam on the very top and the entire construction from a hardware perspective is definitely top notch. Aside from the Gorilla Glass front, we have just a unibody aluminum frame on the entire back as well as the edges and corners. So it feels, again, very similar to an iPad or even a MacBook when it comes to no flexing, the entire thing feeling super sturdy. And on the left-hand spine, you find access to a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and a microphone, along with some shiny chamfered edges that reflects the light. Then on the right-hand spine, there is the aforementioned fingerprint scanner for easily getting into the Windows UI, as well as a volume rocker up top. The keys are pretty tactile and responsive. Then on the bottom here is just a Type-C port, which again, like the first generation 12-inch MacBook, is what's being used here for charging, as well as data. And you can pick up any Type-C hub, which are much more common nowadays for further expansion on the I.O. On the very top here, there are the two stereo Harman Kardon speakers as well as the power key. So purely from the perspective of fit and finish, this is still a pretty incredible piece of hardware and it's hard to imagine something so light is running a full version of Windows. One omission on the hardware though would be any rear-facing camera, which even though taking photos with a tablet, especially one of its size here, is not gonna be something that you do too often, an application where it might be helpful would be scanning in documents, mirroring something that's on a whiteboard, for example. Now one disappointing aspect of the original laptop here from Huawei though was the touchscreen component had 
some manufacturing issues from a part level. And I point that out because the touch sensitivity of the display, if you're using just the flesh of your fingers, that is the capacitive touch, seems to have largely deteriorated over the years. And it's not an occurrence that's unique to only this particular unit that I picked up, but it's widespread. And no, unfortunately, it's not just a driver issue either. But what's interesting here is if you're using a stylus pen, it actually still seems to work all right. So that particular layer of the digitizer is probably not manufactured super well. A little disappointing, despite how well the tablet feels from a build perspective. And it's something that obviously Huawei remedied in later revisions, but it was one con here on the first generation attempt. So what that means is if you're picking this up as a cheap, again, Microsoft Surface alternative, just keep in mind that you may no longer be able to use the actual touchscreen with your fingers anymore unless you can rely on just the stylus alone for drawing and doodling purposes using a Wacom AES pen and again pressing harder will result in a darker line versus a slightly more faint line which is lighter if you press more lightly as well. That being said the display itself is definitely beautiful. It's fully laminated with no gap between the glass and the screen underneath. Super vibrant looking for a IPS panel with very inky contrast and even the brightness here is pretty satisfactory. There is an ambient light sensor by the way, they can automatically detect it and change the brightness from getting a little bit higher versus lower automatically. As for the folio keyboard case, I guess one advantage of a design like this, similar to the Surface, is if the keyboard ever gets dirty or if it breaks down, you can pretty easily replace this instead of having to throw out the entire laptop. In fact, these folios can sometimes be found on the used market for just around $10 to $15 a pop, so it's not too costly at all if this ever again wears down or breaks. That being said, it has a pretty nice overall layout for what it is. Again, the trackpad is made out of frosted glass, so it feels extremely smooth as you are moving the cursor around unlike a lot of plastic trackpads on less expensive convertibles and laptops. The synthetic leather texture also continues on the inside, providing some nice traction to your wrist as you're typing on it. And overall, the keyboard itself is also quite spacious for a 12-inch layout, going almost all the way out to the edges. That being said, the kickstand component of this folio case is a little bit on the lacking side. So there are two angles that you can adjust it into. There is one which is the most upwards position that you can see like this. Alternatively, the magnets can snap onto the back of the tablet slightly higher up, and the screen can also incline a little bit further back as well. But there are only these two positions that you can lock the tablet into. It's not going to be omnidirectional like on a hinge of a conventional laptop, so do keep that in mind. The lapability, just like on some Surface devices, is not going to be quite as strong. In fact, if you're typing on your lap, it might feel just a little bit more loose compared to popping it onto a desk, where you have to also factor in having a little bit of extra space for the kickstand here to still pop itself up compared to the surface area that a regular laptop occupies. But that's a general trade-off of this category as a whole, so we won't ding Huawei too much on that, although it is something they tried to improve on on later revisions of the MateBook E-Line, including having just a few more angles that you can use the folio case in. And in darker environments, you can also activate the backlight on the keyboard, giving you a few different adjustable modes that you can either lower the brightness in or make it a little bit easier to see uh, when you are, again, working in darker environments. Software-wise, this original MateBook came with Windows 10, but can be upgraded to Windows 11 if desired, and the model as configured with 8GB of RAM still seems to be decent enough, again, for getting around the Windows environment without too many issues. In fact, opening up things like menus and navigating around still feels relatively responsive. That being said, there is a base model with only 4 gigs of RAM, which I think would definitely feel a lot more choppy by comparison, especially since the RAM and the built-in SSD, which by the way can max out at 1 TB, cannot be upgraded since everything is soldered in just like on an iPad. So uh, my personal recommendation if you are shopping for a used unit would actually be going towards the 8 gigabyte RAM variant uh, with 4 gigabytes just being a little too low, unfortunately, by 2023-2024 standards. Since Windows is already a little bit more of a resource-heavy operating system, and if you're doing things like web browsing, you want to keep a couple of tabs open. You would ideally need, again, 8 gigabytes as kind of the minimum nowadays. And taking a quick peek at benchmarks as a reference, the M3 variant, which is the 6Y30, again, the exact same chip found on the MacBook 12-inch, clocks in at around 2,163 for the Passmark score. The slightly higher configured M5 6Y54 variant clocks in at 2,300 on Passmark. So it's not a dramatic night and day difference when it comes to the CPU power at the very least. Still, this is a okay score if we are comparing against some truly entry-level Intel Celeron chips on budget laptops and mini PCs just a year or two back, including the N3 350 and N3 450, those clock in around 1,000 to 1,000 
1,900 on pass mark. So this will still have a little bit more power underneath the hood compared to those really ultra low cost newer laptops. Uh, that being said, there are, of course, newer generation entry-level Celeron chips like the N5000 series, the N5100, in fact, being a pretty popular option now that we've seen in several other models floating around on Amazon for around 200 bucks or so, which now clocks in a little higher than 3000 on Passmark. Primarily, that's because even these budget laptops that come from a newer generation are eventually moving into quad-core architecture compared to the M3 and M5s of years past still being a dual-core chip. At least the performance here seems to be a touch better than the really entry-level Celerons and Atoms of years past. And as you can tell here, things are still loading along at a decent rate as you are reading back articles and browsing the web, even on more complex pages like The Verge. It still is actually getting surprisingly decent speeds when it comes to responsiveness. You'll find some occasional moments of choppiness, but nothing that isn't unbearable, especially with such a thin and light laptop at the end of the day. Web pages and documents in particular look great, and you have to scroll a little bit less compared to slightly more stretched 16 by 9 aspect ratio screens, which are more popular on more conventional laptops. So overall, for a web browsing machine, this still feels like a perfectly serviceable experience. I was able to open around 10 to 12 tabs in Chrome and jump back and forth between those tabs, and things were still held into memory and was relatively fast and responsive. And now moving into a quick demo of what the speaker as well as video consumption experience is like. Some takeaway being that the speaker quality is actually decent with good stereo separation since they are positioned at the very top of the tablet. That being said, it definitely isn't quite as full sounding as compared to the actual 12 inch MacBook speakers, which for some reason have more depth in terms of bass. But it definitely doesn't sound shabby, especially for just some casual entertainment. It's more than good enough in terms of volume. You can also again use headphones or wireless Bluetooth instead if desired. Now in terms of video consumption, again, this 2K resolution screen still looks beautiful when it comes to colors and viewing angles. It still is quite impressive for things like that. Although again, because of the more boxy aspect ratio, it's more suited for productivity like web browsing, where on video consumption you will find a little bit larger bars at the top and bottom of the screen as a result, but still is a decent enough experience overall. Overall loading speeds are also decent. You'll find some occasional drop frames, but still not too bad. As long as you just give it a split second longer for it to buffer at the beginning, it still plays back quite smoothly. In fact, as you can tell here, it's not going to be too distracting at all as you are consuming things like TV shows and movies. I think part of that is because the reception quality on the original Matebook is thankfully quite decent. So the dual band Wi-Fi 2.4G slash 5G bands are doing a good enough job of staying connected without too many issues here. Although this particular tablet doesn't come with any cellular connectivity option. As for doing a little bit of gaming, it might be possible if you lower the graphic settings to minimum and look at slightly older titles that is, primarily things like retro emulation, it'll do an okay job at, but slightly newer titles and you have to expect lower graphics as well as frame rates that are primarily in kind of the 20 to 30 FPS range, so definitely not amazing if you're looking for a gaming machine. That being said, you can always consider cloud gaming options such as xCloud via Xbox, or you can try Amazon Luna, and as long as you're connected to the internet, you can still play it back quite smoothly using more powerful servers and hardware from Microsoft and Amazon. So in essence, you really shouldn't get something like this expecting it for it to be a gaming machine. Only expect very casual gaming in general, unless you're trying to use cloud gaming that is primarily just meant for casual computing needs, such as web browsing, as well as a bit of email work, including productivity, office-related tasks like document editing, emails, PDFs, Excels, PowerPoints, those things can still run on here quite well, especially when paired with a pretty decent performing trackpad made out of glass and keyboard for a two-in-one convertible, that is. And again, this aspect ratio is quite good for things like multitasking. You can definitely still watch back a video pretty smoothly while taking notes, for example, if you're doing a lecture uh, or if you're signing in documents and PDFs, that can be another application. So that is more or less it as far as our revisited look back at the Huawei 
MateBook. And ultimately, I think this was a pretty successful start of Huawei's kind of laptop computing business with a really sleek and stylish appearance, even though power underneath the hood is a little bit lacking. Surprisingly, even after all these years, it still looks so clean. And again, for simple computing tasks, including document work, as well as office, watching back videos and browsing the web, it still mostly holds up. That is, if you're going for the 8 gigabyte variant model. So if you are living in a certain locale or market where these are more readily available, again, often at a street price around 100 to 150 bucks, it can still be worth considering at a fraction of the cost of a newer machine, as long as you are okay with a device that's not going to be used primarily for gaming, for example, and also keeping in mind that older devices will have some degree of battery degradation, although this was a relatively energy efficient chip when it debuted. These days, you can expect around three to four hours of screen on time for a used unit, but thankfully, USB Type-C is quite common, so you can always plug in a power bank and use it when on the go, and it charges up pretty quickly. You can learn more details as well as check out more modern Huawei laptops and tablets if interested. Links down below. For now, that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews.